a reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn infants, long for the pure and spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you, then, who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. My name is Jason Wells, and I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Council of Churches. The council is made up of nine different denominations of churches in the state of New Hampshire. And altogether, those uh, denominations have about 400 congregations in the state. And I think that as we continue to take a uh, read through and reflect on God's word in 1 Peter, uh, we have a word from God, a word that is here for our time, a word that is right here for our moment in our churches as we are spread out, as we may be worshiping at home, as we worship in a dispersed way. Because we start to see in this letter, Peter is addressing a situation that he described as exile, as dispersion or diaspora. That's the opening of his letter. He's writing to a large group of churches across what is now Turkey, and all over there are Christians who are too far apart, they're too separate and distant to be able to meet together for worship as they would want to. Uh, they are in this situation that he calls exile, one that it seems far away from the familiar. It's far away from home. It's far away from the uh, synagogues where they once worshipped. It's far away from the temple where Peter himself would go and preach and pray. They're in a world that is disorienting to them as Christians, and it's hard for them to gather together. And so I think that, he, that Peter's words of encouragement and advice might just be the word that we need today. And in this uh, particular section of chapter 2, this particular letter, Peter is writing all about uh, Jesus being the living stone, the cornerstone, the cornerstone of a spiritual house, and a new temple. He's talking about the laying of a foundation for something new to be built upon it. It's not a surprising image, as he's already invoked the image of the exile. In the scriptures, we know that the exile into Babylon was when the people of Israel were uh, conquered by that other nation, taken to the land of Babylon. Their temple was destroyed back in Jerusalem. And they had to reinvent for themselves what it meant to be the chosen people of God. What did it mean for them to be Jewish if there was no more temple, if there were no more priests, <clears throat> if the worship that they knew was totally gone from them? And so we see Peter talking about the foundation of a new spiritual house. And that was exactly what in the uh, scriptures uh, different, uh, different writers were hoping for. The prophets were full of the language of the hope of return from exile 
as they lived in Babylon and encouraged their people in their day, in the 6th century B.C. And we're telling them that someday you too will return to Jerusalem. Your children will return. And the things which were made familiar to us once will be restored to us again. At the very end of the letter of, of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 66, the very end of that book, as he's talking about exactly that, uh, he's writing to the people and says, there will be a day that we get on a highway for, with our God. We get on that highway from Babylon back to Jerusalem, and there will be a new temple for us when we get there. And along the way, Isaiah says, there will be people who join you. You will stop in the various nations and the different countries along the way, and people will be joining you, and God will even choose those nations, those foreigners, to be priests and Levites in the temple, an idea which was probably shocking when it was first heard. And yet here is Peter saying that we will build a spiritual house together, and that you and I, through faith, will be the priests of that new temple. One of the other powerful stories, uh, it comes from the, letter, the book of Ezra. It comes sometime into that return. Isaiah at least had the idea that they would come back and build the temple uh, in the city of Jerusalem. Some things would be changed. There would be foreigners uh, who came along with them to serve in it. But it was still familiar, the temple in the city. And I, Ezra tells us the story of what happened when they were rebuilding. In uh, chapter 3 of Ezra, there's a, a, a couple of verses here about that new foundation, starting at verse 10 in chapter 3. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the direction of King David of Israel, and they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. And the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people, who had seen the first temple on its foundations, they wept with a loud voice when they saw this temple, though many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people who could not dis the people could not distinguish between the sound of the joyful shout and the sound of the people's weeping, for the people shouted so loudly the sound was heard far away. And after seventy years of exile, there were still some people who remembered the beginnings. People well over seventy years old, people who may have just heard the stories from their parents, knowing that some things were familiar again. The land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, the temple, but things were also different and changed. So while they were celebrating it coming back, there was weeping and grief over the things that were lost. And all of this around the building of the new temple. So we can see, I think, that Peter wanted to take up this theme because Peter is in a world where so much had become unfamiliar, so much had become different and changed. There was much uh, that was different, things to grieve uh, the loss of. Everything had changed for Peter, no longer in Jerusalem, now in Antioch, maybe already in Rome. The temple had once again been destroyed in 70, uh, the year 70 after the, death, after the birth of Jesus. Um, in the year 70, the temple is again destroyed. Everything in the world had changed for Peter. But the most important thing that had changed for Peter was not the temple. It wasn't living in a new city or a foreign place. The thing that had changed everything for Peter was in the death and resurrection of Jesus. It was on Good Friday that Peter was in the city of Jerusalem, and he had heard the report of the curtain of the temple, which had been torn from top down to the bottom. It was Peter who was there on Easter Sunday. It was Peter who was with the rest of the disciples when Jesus rose up into heaven. He was there when the Holy Spirit of Jesus came down on Pentecost. 
It wasn't moving to a new city or seeing the second destruction of the temple that was changed everything. But here was the foundational change, the change down in the foundations, in the fundamentals, a change that was irreversible in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Finding himself in a completely new situation while still being rooted in his past. And so he starts to write about this new temple which is being built. But now he can't write about one in Jerusalem being rebuilt with the same stones that were familiar. In uh, chapter 2 there, uh, verse 4, he starts to write, Come to him, he who is the living stone. Come to this Jesus Christ. A moment of evangelism, of calling people into faith with Jesus Christ so that they too can be built into the foundation. They can join the cornerstone as stones of a spiritual temple. This here would be the new form of the dwelling place of God. Right here, uh, Paul would also take it up in his writings as, a, as an apostle in Ephesians, reminding his readers that you yourself by faith have been built into the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Elsewhere, he writes that the dwelling place is found uh, not just in our, in our faith life, but in our physical embodied lives, that our bodies themselves are the dwelling place, the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's Paul who takes that up, but also John, at the very end of the book of Revelation, in his closing chapters in Revelation 21, uh, John gives us his vision that he has of what it looks like in heaven. He sees the new city, the new heavens, the new earth, the new things that God is creating, the new foundations being laid. And John sees this heavenly Jerusalem, he says. And in that heavenly Jerusalem, he looks around the city, but he can't find a temple. No more would there be a temple, for, as it says, God's dwelling is with human beings, with you and me. God will be with God's people unmediated, out in the open, all of us built into that connection directly by our faith. Come to him, the living stone, so that you can be built into that new reality, making good on the promise that goes back at least to John the Baptist, who said, do not say for yourselves we are children of Abraham, because I will tell you now, God will bring new children for Abraham, out of these stones right here on the ground. Because it's here that we know that in the ancient world, right up into our own day, uh, people build new houses. They build buildings out of the local stones. It's my friend. Uh, I was in a conversation with a friend, Chris Legg, um, a couple months back, and he was uh, showing me an old house that dated back to at least the 1600s. And he was telling me uh, to look at the stones that are made in this house. And do you recognize the limestone that's here? Because that's the limestone that is in this village, that's in this, as all over the fields uh, where we were. Because houses and buildings are made out of the local stone. I can only imagine uh, the granite people of New Hampshire being built into a house, into a temple for God. For we are right here, the people ready to be built in. Now we know we're at a special time, this moment where our churches in New Hampshire, maybe your church is already starting to uh, talk about uh, the next stages, what lies ahead for us. Many of us were, of our churches were so ready, we moved very quickly and well into a period of online worship, uh, of in-person worship being discontinued, of fellowship uh, through Zoom and other technologies. <clears throat> Some of you were watching uh, our governor's stay-at-home order that came out uh, last Friday um, and are thinking there may be another stay-at-home order, a 2.0 and a 3.0, and what's going to be changing? What will be there? At least implying that someday there will be a return, that this situation that we're in now will not be forever. But even though it's not forever, things will be different. They will be changed. Things won't go back just the way they were, like they were for the people in Ezra's story, who saw something new and yet had lost some things in the past. 
there's one Episcopal bishop who uh, lived, uh, he was the Bishop of Mississippi, Bishop Duncan Gray Jr. And he was the bishop in Mississippi during the civil rights struggles of the 1960s. Not an easy place uh, to lead people spiritually through the changes and the tumultuous period of the civil rights struggle. And he would visit uh, the Episcopal churches of Mississippi, and people constantly asked him, every time he went somewhere, the story was told, uh, that people would ask him, Bishop, Bishop Gray, why do we have to live in these times? And Bishop Gray had two answers for them, for those people who wanted to live in a different period, a less challenging period, who knew that things were changing and would never be the same. Bishop Gray would say to them, these times were meant to change you. God intended this time to challenge you, to cause you to grow. They were there to wake you up. They were there to make you shake off your indifference. But also that God intended for you to be here for these times. That God could have brought uh, the civil rights struggle at, uh, m many times in history, but here it is now. Because God needed you to rise to this occasion. God wanted you to be a part of the changing of the world. And so we know that our churches are going to return someday. Not soon, but someday. And we will have churches that need to be rebuilt. Just like the temples of old that had to be rebuilt on their foundations. And Peter encouraged his followers to rebuild on their foundations. And we do it again. And churches, of course, will also be a part, not just of rebuilding themselves, but we will be a part of rebuilding the world around us. We will be a part of building that new world in the shelter and the shell of the old, taking that which was old, building that which is new. We will build a new church in the shell of the old, realizing some things will never come back, but God will provide the things for the new, and we rebuild ourselves once again, as a spiritual temple, a spiritual house, to be the presence and the dwelling place of God among human beings. With you, in you, among you, and between you. There's a story told of a church in England. <clears throat> it was Holy Trinity Church in Staunton Harold. The church was built in 1653. It was the time of the English Civil War, when uh, Puritans were demolishing churches. They were smashing stained glass windows uh, in a time when everything was up for grabs, when people were dying, when the war seemed to shake the basic foundations of English life. And in that moment, there was one, uh, one man... Uh, in the manor at Staunton Herald, Sir Robert Shirley. And he decided that when churches were being demolished, he was going to build a new one. He was going to lay a new foundation in that moment. And if you go to this church uh, in Staunton Herald, Holy Trinity Church, there's a plaque uh, over the door, uh, which simply says this. In the year 1653, when all things sacred were throughout the nation either demolished or profaned, Sir Robert Shirley founded this church, whose singular praise it is to have done the best of things in the worst of times and to have hoped them in the most calamitous. That we know that we will rebuild our world, we will rebuild our church, we will. Not just that, but we will rebuild ourselves, our souls, and our bodies, coming to Jesus Christ, the living stone, and be part of the foundation of the new, living, dwelling place of God.